Hi, this is Nick Rebulis. I'm a member of the International Academy of Education, um, and we sponsor a booklet series called Educational Practices that we co-sponsor with the UNESCO International Board of Education. Um, and it's a series of small research-based booklets on issues of educational policy and practice uh, that are intended to be very concrete, hands-on guides to educational practitioners. Uh, today's guest is Keith Topping. Uh, he co-authored a booklet called Philosophy for Children with uh, Steve Tricky and Paul Cleghorn. Uh, and Keith, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. So let's get started. And let me ask you sort of the sort of the obvious initial question. Most people, I'm a philosopher by training. Most people who haven't really studied philosophy or who maybe don't know very much about it see it as an extremely abstract, difficult high level discipline that really is only of interest to specialists. And they might look at this booklet and go, what, philosophy for children? What is? What do you mean by that? And in what way would philosophy be relevant to teaching even relatively young children? Well, the, the first thing we've got to say is that this booklet is definitely not about uh, the great philosophers. Um, although, the, you know, there's, the, Socrates is in there somewhere, but never mentioned by name. So it's very much about practical philosophy. It's very much about children having philosophical and logical thoughts about things and essentially learning to think more effectively. So it's not at all like academic philosophy or the kind of philosophy that grown-ups would talk about. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about that, that way of thinking about philosophy. The booklet emphasizes and really addresses in detail a number of specific uh, cognitive or learning benefits to children from studying philosophy, or I would say, I would say learning how to think philosophically, uh, for yeah. example, metacognition. Can you say more about those benefits and specifically how teaching philosophy uh, or teaching students to think philosophically can help to promote those cognitive and learning outcomes? Well, I, I, I should say that in the evaluations, um, as well as looking at children's thinking, we also applied uh, standardized tests of cognitive thinking. And the students did well on those in the short term and indeed did well on them in the long term. So there's certainly evidence there of generalization to what could be considered a pretty abstract and rigorous assessment of children's thinking. But more to the point is looking at the way children think in practice. And what we find is that there's very often in philosophy for children lessons, a change in the classroom dynamic. The teacher is much less likely to be instructing from the front, although they certainly lead and organize the session. And then you've got children working with children and testing their ideas with each other. Um, so what you have is a situation where children learn that the way they think is not the way everybody thinks. So that has implications for them learning something, not just about their own metacognition, but the metacognition of other children. Yeah, uh, so what are some of the other uh, potential learning benefits or learning outcomes of thinking, <laughs> learning to think philosophically? Well, what we see is that quite often you will get uh, a knock-on effect into other classes and into the school playground. So that what you may find is in the school playgrounds, children start behaving in a more civilized and thoughtful manner towards each other. So very often you've got kids who will intervene when younger kids are having a squabble and, uh, you know, talk through the options, the optional solutions that there are to whatever problem those children are, are, are presenting. Uh, and of course, what we're hoping for is impact beyond the school, impact on everyday life. So we're hoping that this has a long-term effect that will result in children growing up to be 
more thoughtful, more logical, more uh, alert uh, uh, citizens and less likely to be influenced by the kind of fake information that floats around on social media. Yeah, that's a great point. So let me just build on that. I'm actually teaching a class on teaching critical thinking this very term. And just before this interview, I was preparing notes for my lecture tonight and really emphasized in, in this class session, the role of critical thinking in terms of learning how to assess reasons, assess evidence, uh, assess information. Um, and uh, clearly those kinds of skills would also be pertinent to the kind of benefits that you're talking about of learning how to think philosophically. I, I, absolutely, yeah. But I mean, you're, you're doing this with university students, but we start with literally with kindergarten students. I mean, we've done philosophy for children with kindergartners and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty smart kindergartners, even though teachers are sometimes a bit doubtful that they're going to be able to get the hang of this. The kids do cue in pretty well and do begin to see that there are different ways of looking at problems and maybe there's more than one solution or maybe even there's no solution, but at least they've thought about the question in greater detail. Yeah, I think most parents who have had a four-year-old or a five-year-old who answers every response with why, 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 knows that That's young it. children certainly are capable of thinking philosophically. That's it, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So one of the strengths of this book, Keith, is that each section of the book does give fairly specific advice about lesson activities or specific instructional examples of how this kind of teaching can take place again, even with very, very young children. Do you want to just pick two or three examples of how teachers who want to teach philosophy or teach, again, the way I'm putting it, teaching students to think philosophically, some examples of how they might implement that in the classroom? Well, I, I mean, typically uh, in an elementary school classroom, what you have is the teacher presenting some sort of stimulus, which may be an object or a, or, or, or a book or a story or a poem. Mm -hmm. And of course, that stimulus can be about a very general question that's difficult to answer. Or if the teacher wants to set this in the context of a subject, it could be, for instance, a science question that's very difficult to answer that the kids need to debate about. And then the teacher solicits from the children what sort of questions they would wish to answer. And then the teacher helps the students select one particular question to focus on and then solicits possible answers from the class, but then gets the kids to work in pairs or maybe in small groups to discuss these issues and in the course of that realize the very different points of view that different children have. And then at the end of the session, the children are gathered back together again for a, a kind of a plenary session where the resolution between the different solutions offered by different groups is explored. There may be a resolution or there may not. But either way, we've improved our definition of the question. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, 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 the basic cycle of a lesson. Um, I'll stop that. Okay. Well, let me pick up on one point that you've already touched on, and it comes up in the context of your example. One of the points you make in the book is that one of the challenges for this approach to teaching is that it does require the teacher to give up a certain conception of authority. Uh, and a certain notion that many teachers might have that their main job is to communicate skills and knowledge and information to students, whereas this mode of teaching is more open ended. Um, it includes a higher tolerance for uncertainty, uh, asking questions, and may even include students posing difficult questions to the teacher. Um, that uh, are show sort of a philosophical or critical or questioning mode mm -hmm. of thought. That can be an uncomfortable position for certain teachers, given their traditional ideas about what the teacher role is. Can you say more about that and how teachers can navigate the, sh the, the shift in mindset 
that comes with teaching a class in this way, as you say, across different kinds of subject matters. This kind sure. of thing can come yeah. up in many different areas of the curriculum. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no doubt that when a teacher first tries to do philosophy for children, it can be pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, one, one has to say that teachers of a more rigid disposition probably wouldn't go there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we're only looking at volunteer teachers who are interested in doing this. But once they do it, they still find it pretty scary. But over time they'll get more and more used to this change in their role where they're no longer seen as the uh, imparter of all wisdom and are increasingly seen as a facilitator and organizer who keeps the session flowing, but doesn't actually interfere in it in to any, to any great extent. I mean, the, the role of the teacher is still very, very important. It's just a somewhat different role. The other thing we should say in terms of challenges is the one that teachers always bring up about any kind of innovation, which is, oh, we haven't got time. Now, of course, if you're going to introduce an innovation into your classroom, that means by definition, it's going to displace something else. So teachers tend to be a bit unwilling to have things displaced and tend to want to try and cram everything in and overstuff the, the 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 curriculum which is not really a good idea because you just end up covering everything very shallowly instead of covering at least a few things in somewhat greater depth so you've got to have teachers who are prepared to innovate to give up things to change a little bit in order to introduce philosophy for children yeah that's helpful so let me just build on that with another question so how much of this is adding additional content to the curriculum uh, versus well, it's not, how, yeah, how, it's, they, how teachers actually teach the con how they teach the content that they do teach, whether it's science or literature or math or history. Yeah, well, I mean, that, 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 that's certainly another issue. And, and philosophy for children is essentially content free. I mean, it, it doesn't come with a whole bundle of worksheets that teachers can just uh, ream off and uh, get kids to fill in. It's not based on a checklist. During the course of Philosophy for Children, teachers are thinking really, really hard and have to be prepared to meet with the unpredictable, as you suggested earlier. So uh, there's, there's no doubt that it's hard work for teachers. Um, but... Uh, it's perfectly possible not to have a philosophy for children as a separate lesson, but to locate it within an existing subject lesson. So it's relatively easy to locate it in science, for instance. It's relatively easy to locate it in social studies or history or geography, where there are many questions that don't have clear or definite answers. Yeah, so um, one of the things that struck me about the book, now you've already touched on the fact uh, in one of the earlier comments about students who, who study, study and learn to think this way, to use your phrase, may also be more civilized in how they interact with their peers or with other people. It struck me that this booklet does not say very much about the issue of moral development. Uh, and obviously ethics is a major area in the field of philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. But this booklet doesn't say very much about how studying and thinking about philosophy or philosophical questions may also promote ethical or moral conduct. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were about that topic. Well, I would argue that philosophy for children certainly does stimulate thinking about moral and ethical concepts, mm -hmm. but it doesn't do that on the basis of a body of content knowledge which is rooted in academic uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. it, it requires the children to generate their own thoughts about moral and ethical issues in real life as they go along. And I would argue that that is a much more powerful way of linking ethical and moral principles to changes in behavior than sitting studying a philosophy tome 
um, or the lives of the great philosophers. Mm -hmm. Well, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, any final comments you want to share? Again, we're not discussing everything that's in the booklet. I want it's really a very rich and and extremely useful set of of sort of research research based recommendations about uh, how to actually do this uh, in teaching and in the classroom. Uh, but are there any final points you want to add? Well, just really to encourage people to give it a try now. If you're the only person in a school who's interested in this, it, it's kind of difficult because you would be a bit nervous about launching out on your own. But mm -hmm. if in the staff room you can begin to have conversations about this and see what other, uh, uh, what other, what other people there are in the school who have any interest in this kind of work, mm -hmm. if you get a little group of two or three of you together to support each other, then you're going to feel a good deal more comfortable about taking a small pilot initiative forward. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, just because Philosophy for Children has worked in many, many different settings in many, many different countries, doesn't mean it's going to work right there where you are. So it makes sense just to start with a small pilot initiative and see how you go. So a small team and a pilot initiative would be my recommendations. Yeah, I think your book says that it's been implemented on a fairly broad scale across at least 60 or 70 different countries. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, and in many different languages. I mean, it is language free, of course. Absolutely. Keith, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure talking with you. And I really do want to encourage people to click on the link uh, and read the book. It's not very long, but it's really rich and extremely full of helpful guidelines. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. Nice to talk to you, Nicholas. Take care. Mm -hmm.